And uh, I know our youth choir is a little thin and we're not singing a special tonight, but I've had uh, people ask. And so youth choir that's here, uh, folks are expecting you all to keep uh, it up and not fall off the wagon. So we're going to be bringing some special music again real soon. I had a few announcements to make uh, before I preach tonight. Uh, first of all, uh, Brother Tim Allison's funeral, I think most of you have heard now, but that'll be Friday at 1 o'clock, and there's a large church on Gullick Street. I believe it's the First Assembly of God in Muskogee. Is that correct? And, um, but, and I want to encourage you, if you can, uh, possibly go. Uh, uh, I know that the family would appreciate it, and that building, I think, is large enough that it will be able to handle us. Um, but those of you that knew and loved Tim, uh, I think it would be a wise uh, investment of a, an hour or two to go and uh, support just so, uh, I know he's now been gone, you know, over a week, but, um, and I pray that you're continuing to think of Herb and Kim and the family. Um, that service will be live streamed on uh, the Keepton Baptist Church. I think it's on Facebook Live. And those of you that are live streamed in the last year uh, are familiar with how that works. So you would be able to watch it if you can't go. Another announcement I had is um, we have our church camp coming up, our youth camp in June. And it'll be June 28th through July 2nd. Um, and I want to encourage any of you... Um, young people to go ahead and sign up if you know you're coming we've already paid a deposit we've got about 30 um, or 35 spots there reserved and so get signed up um, and we do need you to pray about being a sponsor if you, if I would love to have too many people volunteer to sponsor that'd be awesome for me to say you know I'm sorry we've got too many people we don't need you but uh, it's always good to have uh, an extra uh, leader there for whatever reason our children some of them can be high maintenance amen and then I also want to mention to be in prayer this week I was in conversation and contact through text with um, uh, brother Ryan Nez our missionary to the Navajo reservation around Winter Rock Arizona area and uh, last night we spoke and he is excited about the, the prospect of us going and taking a mission trip uh, there, uh, He does have some physical work, some construction projects that we could help him with. Um, his men have done a lot. If you go, you'll see that. But and Because, because on the phone I said, Brother Ron, we don't want to come in and assume we can do stuff that y'all can't handle and all that. He said, no, but the men that work, that pitch in and help, he said most of them have already taken off all of their vacation, those that have... Uh, good jobs and have used those up helping me he said and there are still things to be done so uh, whether it's building an, an awning kind of a porch out in front of their building uh, or maybe building a storage shed on the back end of their church or built tearing out some walls for growth in their sanctuary there are projects to be done uh, but he has a few things on his calendar that he's needing to work around and he's leaning very heavily towards the end of July, possibly first few weeks of August. It will be hot, but he said it's hot and dry starting in June. There's really no, no difference, he said, really. Uh, I mean, it's a different kind of heat than here. And um, he, I think, has come through here. And he thinks our Julys on Lake Eufaula when it's 98 degrees and 98% humidity is worse. Uh, than, than the Navajo Nation heat there in Arizona. But pray about that because that is something that we're going to try to get scheduled and I know we'll need people willing to go and serve. With that out of the way, if you've got your Bibles tonight, go ahead and take them out. And we're going to be going to the book of Joshua. And tonight we are going to look at Numbers uh, we'll go back to a passage we, some of you remember, we were introduced in Numbers 13 and 14 to Caleb and Joshua as young spies. Now we're 40 years later, and we're going to look at Caleb and Joshua both now taking possession of the land they had scouted out over 40 years earlier. And the title of the message really is going to be How to Have a Courage Like Caleb. 
I believe we're moving into a time in our country and in our lives as believers where we are going to need more and more of what I believe is could be referred to as Christian courage or a holy boldness. Because as we move closer, I believe, to the return of Christ, apostasy will become greater and persecution will begin to increase. And so if, if ever there was a time for believers to have a spine, if you will, yes. now is the time. Right. We need to be willing to be bold and confident for Christ. But the questions could be asked, how do you have courage for a fight that may seem intimidating? How do you have confidence moving into the next chapter, whatever chapter that may be? And so I believe as we look at Caleb's life, we'll get answers that can be applicable to our lives. So if you would stand with me, Joshua chapter 14, and we'll start with verse 6. And by the way, I know it's been a couple weeks since we were in Joshua. We had just come out of the story after Jericho and the walls fell. And then Ai, they get their little fannies kicked by a little Ai, if y'all remember the story. And then they defeat Ai. And then they get tricked by Gibeon. The last two messages we had were kind of the title, A Deal's A Deal. And we talked about getting fooled because they didn't consult God. But we also talked about kind of the special place that Gibeon became. became a place where God met Solomon and the Gibeonites, uh, long after many Israelites had apostatized and been lost, years and years later, matter of fact, over a thousand years later, there were Gibeonites helping rebuild the wall. So there was kind of a neat covenant made, even though it was done uh, in, with a little bit of subterfuge, a little bit of trickery on the Gibeonites' part. But they got in with the right crowd when they made a covenant with the people of God. And we, we discussed that. Well, now we're moving uh, on beyond that. Uh, a lot of the book of Joshua is the division of the land, the promised land. And that's what's going on when we pick up here in verse 6. It's Joshua chapter 14. It says, Then the children of Judah came unto Joshua in Gilgal. And Caleb the son of Jephunneh, the Kenazite, said unto him, Thou knowest the thing that the Lord said unto Moses, the man of God, concerning me and thee in Kadesh Barnea. Forty years old was I when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to espy out the land. And I brought him word again as it was in mine heart. Nevertheless, my brethren that went up with me made the heart of the people melt. But I wholly followed the Lord my God. And Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land whereon thy feet have trodden shall be thine inheritance and thy children's forever, because thou hast wholly followed the Lord my God. And now, behold, the Lord hath kept me alive, as he said, these forty and five years, even since the Lord spake this word unto Moses, while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness. And now, lo, I am this day fourscore and five years old. Those of you that aren't real good with 1600 math, four score and five is 85. He was 85 years old. As yet, I am as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me. As my strength was then, even so is my strength now for war, both to go out and to come in. Now, therefore, Give me this mountain whereof the Lord spake in that day. For thou heardest in that day how the Anakims were there, and that the cities were great and fenced. If so be the Lord will be with me, then I shall be able to drive them out, as the Lord said. And Joshua blessed him, and gave unto Caleb the son of Jephunneh Hebron for an inheritance. Hebron therefore became the inheritance of Caleb the son of Jephunneh the Kenazite unto this day, because that he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. And the name of Hebron before was Kirjath Arba, which Arba was a great man among the Anakims, and the land had rest from war. And if you would, just turn a page over if your Bible's like mine. And it says in verse 13 of chapter 15, And unto Caleb the son of Jephunneh he gave a part among the children of Judah, according to the commandment of the Lord to Joshua, even the city of Arba, the father of Anak, which city is Hebron. And Caleb drove thence the three sons of Anak, Shishai and Ahiman and Talmai, the children of Amnak. 
We're going to talk about an old giant killer, Caleb, tonight and his courage. Lord, we love you and praise you. God, I thank you for your word. And Lord, I pray tonight as we look at this passage that, Lord, we would be encouraged and edified by it. God, I pray you challenge, convict us if necessary. And Lord, I pray that each one of us as your children, as believers, would be better equipped for the work of the ministry that you've given each one of us. God, I pray that we'd be willing to take possession of everything that you intend for us to have as your children. God, I pray that if someone here is lost, that you'd reveal that to them and that they would be saved is our prayer. God, I, I pray that you would be exalted and glorified. I pray for believers in our church that still have heavy hearts. Lord, we have some that are sick and, and ill. And Lord, there's many still mourning. Lord, I lift up the Allison family. God, I pray that you continue to be a balm to them, uh, an anointment that will heal their broken heart. Lord, that your Holy Spirit would bring joy and peace in knowing where Brother Tim is. Lord, I'm grateful for your gospel. Lord, I'm grateful for the fact that eternal life means we will have a reunion one day, and I'm grateful for that. And so I pray that you'd bring peace. Lord, we ask you to take this time and bless it and use it for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Well, if you have been with us, and, and this is, by the way, we're not traveling through the whole uh, Old Testament exhaustively. Some of you are like, well, I'm getting exhausted. Well, we're not, we're not going to cover everything in detail, but we're hitting high, sp high spots. My goal was to kind of cover some stories that maybe at one time uh, m most American children would have heard. There was a time when the Bible was not considered a banned book, even amongst school children, amen? And the people knew who Joshua and Caleb were. People knew about Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel. And, and so sometime back, we started just going through some of the Old Testament characters that you may not have been acquainted with before. And tonight, we highlight Caleb. And, and I love the story of Caleb. It is interesting, very quickly, as I was looking at different commentaries, it was pointed out that Caleb is an interesting name. There was an evil king just a few chapters before this whose name meant Lord of Righteousness. Isn't that interesting? But he was evil. Caleb's name means dog. But he was anything but. And by the way, especially in a Hebrew's mind, a dog was not a compliment. Now, many point out that the name Caleb had come what, had somewhat come to be modified to mean all heart or loyal and or sometimes rough or rambunctious, which tells me that dogs haven't changed much. Amen? There was probably some folks that had some affectionate, positive qualities that they looked at. And so Caleb's name was by no means a curse. But it's clear that this man created a good name where at first his name might have in, been intended otherwise. Caleb was a man that I believe we can take as an example. There's very few Old Testament characters that are held up as an example of good character qualities all the way around. But it's repeated about Caleb that he wholly followed the Lord his God. We know he was... Not sinless or perfect, but as we read his story, there's things we ought to take note of. And so we're going to look at this man, Caleb. How did Caleb move when others stood still? How did Caleb thrive and survive when all of those around him fell by the wayside? Caleb literally was one in a million. You may say, what do you mean by that? Well, can I tell you this? If Caleb is 85 and he's talking to Joshua, there was nobody in Israel that was within 20 years of their age. Now, we know this because all of the Israelites that were 20 and older had died in the wilderness. So now they've been inside the promised land for a few years, but the truth is that when they crossed Jordan and began to take possession, the oldest soldier out there, the oldest man was 60 years old. He was just about to turn 20 and so God spared him. 
He could have entered the promised land 59, 60 years old, but nobody was older than that. Everybody else's carcasses were littered all the way around the wilderness. That's what the Bible says. See, the 40-year wandering wasn't just because they were lost. It was a death sentence to the men who refused to go in and claim what God had promised. In Numbers chapter 13 and 14, and I'm not going to go back because we preached it when we went there, when we were there, 10 out of the 12 spies discouraged the hearts of the people. But Caleb and Joshua had a different spirit. They said, hey, it's a good land and we've seen the fruit. One time my dad preached a message and he said something along these lines that in Joshua and Caleb's mind, the fruit was worth the fight. And they knew there was a fight. They knew there were walled cities and giants, but they thought that the, fi- the fruit was worth the fight. But now we see 85-year-old Caleb. Listen, they've already conquered Jericho and Ai, and they've destroyed five major kings who had kingdoms that had risen against Gibeon. These battles had already taken place, and now it was clear to the Israelites, and by the way, the Canaanites and the Amorites, it was clear that God was giving them this land, and it was time to start dividing it up. And it was in that context that Caleb shows up and says, Joshua... I know you're breaking up the land, but I know where mine is already. And he made a very peculiar request. After reading this, I'm convinced that this area that he claims, the area that would become Mount Hebron, Kirjath Arba, it meant the place of or the city of Arba. You may say, well, what does that mean? Well, Arba was a man of renown. He was a giant. And when I say giant, listen, he was the father of Anak and the Anakim. That was plural. The sons of Anak were giants. Almost 400 years later, there would be a descendant because Caleb cleaned the giants out of his territory, but the rest of Israel allowed some of them to settle in the coasts of Philistia around Gath. And later on, there's a young man that faces one. His name was Goliath. Same group of people that Caleb voluntarily said, I'll go after them. Listen, these men, I, I, was, in the, uh, I was in the airport one time and a basketball, college basketball, I think it was ORU or, or TU, but I was at the Tulsa airport when a group of basketball players walked by and there were two guys close to seven foot. And I'm telling you, it was intimidating. Now think about this, they were only 11 or 12 inches taller than me. Right? But they seemed to tower over me. It was kind of intimidating. Do you know that the information we have, these sons of Anak, they were, as, they were close to 10 foot tall. 10 foot tall. That means one of the largest human beings that some of us may be familiar with, Shaquille O'Neal. If you were to put Shaquille O'Neal and Samuel, my son, side by side, the disparity between them would be equally as great if you stood one of the sons of Anak beside Shaq. Did y'all get that? They would be another three foot taller than him. Can you imagine that? Listen, they would have been massive. And it is these men, these three particular brothers, and I'm sure there were others, descendants and things like that, but these three men were so big that when the 12 spies saw them, It completely debilitated them. They were the reason. By and large, they were one of the main reasons the children of Israel refused to go into the promised land. They said, hey, we're like grasshoppers to them. In our eyes, we look like grasshoppers to them, and so we are in their eyes too. Now, I just thought of something because in the Bible, this... That was bothering me, I'm sorry. Um... In the Bible, their names are mentioned. The sons of Anak are mentioned over and over again. Like it's repeated. You'll find this same account in the first chapter of Judges listed. And these men by name. It's almost as if the author of Joshua, we know he's inspired by God. But his initial audience, those children of Israel, all you'd have to do is say those names. They were men that everybody understood the imposing nature of these three infamous giants. They were, they were big and they were bad. And I think it's very likely that when the spies went up to Mount Hebron, which was actually Kirjath Arba, 
I think they may have seen him and conversed with him. I mean, either that or these guys were making stuff up. They said, we look like grasshoppers to us, and that's how they looked at us. I mean, it's possible that one of these giants said, what are you, I, y'all don't look familiar. Where are y'all from? We're, we just come out of Egypt. We're, we're looking at the land God gave us, and they, I mean, I'm wondering, did those giants go, y'all are grasshoppers. We'll squish y'all like bugs. They said, yep. It's the way it looks to us too. (laughs) See you later. We'll see you in 40 years. We ain't coming back here. But listen, it was intimidating. Yet Caleb was more than ready to go in. He was 85 years old. The interesting thing is the very three men that scared off the ten spies 40 years earlier were still waiting for Caleb in the mount. Same giants still there. How was Caleb able and ready to go to Joshua and beg for that mountain that, by the way, doesn't look like anybody else was real excited about taking anyways. How did he do that? Well, first of all, Caleb stood on past promises. This is important. Look at our text here, Joshua chapter uh, 14. The Bible says in verse 6 that Caleb says that he came to Joshua and he said unto him, Thou knowest the thing that the Lord said unto Moses, the man of God, concerning me. Do you know what Caleb does? He brings up the word of God. The word of God. You remember what God said. You remember God's promises concerning me and thee in Kadesh Barnea. Forty years old was I when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to espy out the land. And as I brought him word again, and I brought him word again as it was in my heart. Then he gives the account. But he says, I wholly followed the Lord my God. And this was no proud boast on his part. The Bible confirms Caleb's assessment. He said he did follow the Lord. How did Caleb have the courage at 85 to face these infamous giant men? Well, he did that because he says in verse 9, And Moses swear on... Swear on that day, saying, Surely the land whereon thy feet have trodden shall be thine inheritance and thy children's forever, because thou hast wholly followed the Lord my God. See, Moses said this to Caleb. You may say, well, how would Caleb remember that? Because I don't think this was the first time Caleb rehearsed it. I think Caleb held fast to that which he had been told. Listen, in my mind, I am convinced that Caleb found these promises of God to be just as fresh 45 years later as they were the day they were spoken. Listen, he was 85, but he had not built his life on manna that perished. He had not built his life on the fact that he had some really awesome shoes that didn't wear out. He had built his life on the fact that he was going to the promised land, and even though everybody else had been condemned to die in the wilderness, he had received a promise. He had, and listen, you may say, but Clay, that promise was 45 years old. Did he still believe God was going to honor it? Absolutely. He stood on past promises. He related and recited from memory to Joshua what had taken place all the way back in the book of Numbers. Numbers 14, 24, in case you're a little fuzzy on it. He says in verse 24, after God condemned the whole nation of Israel for their grumbling and complaining, in verse 24 he says, But my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him, and hath followed me fully, him will I bring into the land whereinto he went, and his seed shall possess it. See, Caleb was simply quoting the word of God. How are you going to stand when you face a challenging mountain full of giants? How are you going to stand? Because listen, I understand that we're not possessing land, but if you think you're not in a battle, you are wrong. Listen, the Bible says we are in spiritual warfare. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Listen, you will have giants and there will be walled cities you're going to have to face. It's just that they're spiritual. And the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God. And do you know where you're liable to get your tail kicked? Right here in your mind. So what are the weapons that you use? 
where do you get your confidence? Listen, Caleb literally had to fight physical giants. But I think it's very instructive to know that the strength that he had did not come from the awesome sword that he had. We don't get, you know, we don't get any details about his physical weapons, but we do get to see his mindset. And he said that God had promised me, and I'm holding to that. He molded it over and over in his head for 45 years. God promised me that. Listen, I'm walking around in the desert now, but I'm going to live on a mountain one day. <clears throat> That's what he knew. He knew that, hey, listen, this, uh, yeah, this is neat. The man is great. Walking around and having the, temp, the tabernacle here and living in a tent is fine. But one day I'm going to live in a mountain. I'm going to take the mountain that I saw. He pondered this. Do you know in the Gospel of Luke, when you read about Jesus' early days, you have Luke repeat this phrase. Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Mary kept these sayings and pondered them in her heart. It was almost as if Luke gives us insight that Mary meditated on the Word of God. She meditated on the things that she saw. Do you know that we're commanded to do the same thing? We're commanded to think on our testimony and hold it fast. Hebrews 10, 23 says, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. Do you know he says, Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together in verse 24. But in 23 he says, Hold fast the profession of your faith. Do you know that you sharing your testimony is important? Do you know that you will be strengthened for the fight if you will occasionally talk about your testimony? The Bible says you're supposed to do that. You're supposed to remember your experience and your testimony. The Bible says in Revelation that they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. Are you occasionally looking for opportunities to share your testimony? I believe this was not the first time Caleb had said this. I don't believe this is the first time Caleb... I mean, I'll just be real honest. I think sometimes maybe his beautiful daughter Axa would say, Dad... Dad, I'd, I'd like to get married. And I think Caleb probably said, well, we will. We're going to have a mountain outdoor wedding, though, darling. I mean, I'm just saying, she would have said, Dad, what are you talking about? And I think he said, well, you know what? God promised me and my seed, that includes you, a mountain, the mount that's going to be called Hebron. Right now, it's the place of this giant called Arba, but it's going to be ours because God promised it. I just believe this wasn't the first time he had rehearsed it. I believe that he stood on it, that he molded it over because he was quick to remind Joshua. He was reciting the word of God. Do not just his, this is important. It wasn't just his experience. Do you know your experience is important? One of Saul, who became Paul... His favorite methods of sharing the gospel was telling about what happened to him on the road to Damascus. Amen? I mean, listen, he was on a tri in a trial trying to give account for himself, raising a stink amongst his own people, the Jews, where the Romans had to come in and calm everything down. And do you know where he went? He went right back to the road to Damascus to explain how he met Jesus. You ought to have a road to Damascus story. You had, ought to have a Kadesh Barnea story where you could say, Hey, I remember. I remember when God gave me the promise of eternal life, where I trusted Him as my Lord and Savior. I remember when I got saved. I remember. Listen, you ought to know your testimony. But can I tell you something? Only personal experience and testimonies are not enough to build victory on. Not, not that alone. Can I tell you something? Some people have some really weird experiences. Amen? Listen, I, I've asked people, are they Christians? And they've said, yeah. And I said, well, tell me about how you got saved. And then they went into the twilight zone with me. Amen? <laughs> Like, really? What are you talking about? Yeah, I mean, listen, there's some people who maybe it was chemically induced, but they've had some wild experiences. You can't just live basing your life off of experience. Amen? And Caleb didn't. Caleb was not just living based off of his experience. His experience was important. 
But that's because his experience tied in with the Word of God. And he remembered God's Word. Do you know that we are commanded to keep the Word of God? When Joshua was given the reins of control of the leadership of Israel, Joshua 1.8, God charged him, Joshua, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night, and observe to do all that is written therein. Then you will have your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. How many of us actively are involved in infusing the Word of God into our heart? <clears throat> do you know you remember stuff that's important to you? <coughs> Excuse me. You remember what's important to you. I've had people tell me, listen, I'm over the hill. I can't remember anything anymore. <clears throat> That's not true. You know how to get home, don't you? Yes. Amen? <laughs> you remember things that are important to you. You remember, listen, I know men who have told me they can't <clears throat> read the Word. Maybe they're not as literate as they'd like to be and they can't remember the Word of God. But then they are quick to pull out their phone and they're a, well able to text and read uh, the stats on their favorite sports team. I find that a little interesting. Right? I mean, they, they know who the quarterback is for their favorite team. Why? They remember it. Do you remember the Word of God? Listen, Psalms 119.11 says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. I'm telling you, if you're going to have victory and courage like Caleb had then you're going to have to stand on past promises. Do you know what salvation is? It is a present day confidence in a very old past promise. You may say an old past promise. That's right. Listen, it's when Jesus says in John 5, 24, He that heareth these sayings and believeth on him that sent me has everlasting life, that's a promise I'm claiming. Amen? I don't care if it's 2,000 years old. Christ Jesus said it. Caleb stood on past promises. And then Caleb stayed strong in the present. See, he listed to Joshua what did happen in the past. But then in verse 10 he says, And now, behold, the Lord hath kept me alive. The Lord hath kept me alive. I love this because he... In a, listen, I think this was a... A demonstration of Caleb understanding God's faithfulness and grace when he said, God has kept me alive. Listen, if you do the math, that 40 years in the wilderness, I was talking to somebody, if you assume that there was about the same amount of females as males, I said he was one in a million, just say there was an even number. We're talking about 1.2 million people that died in 40 years. I mean, that's the numbers that you find in the Scripture if you study. If that's true, do you know what we're talking about? We're talking about multiple funerals every day. Every day. Isn't that wild? And can I tell you something? That means every day whenever the men of Israel would come together and maybe they'd be called to the door of the tabernacle, there'd be a list of names read off who died today. And listen, I believe at some point there was people saying, Hey, Uncle Caleb, all of your classmates now are gone. That was the last one of them. And you know what, Caleb? Caleb had a promise that those men didn't have. But Caleb also knew that just as it was God exercising judgment through providential means. Listen, I don't necessarily believe that just... God was just supernaturally smiting people. But something or another would happen and they died, all of them, but not Caleb. And Caleb says to Joshua, God has kept me alive. But he didn't just keep me alive, he says. Listen, he gave credit, he acknowledged God's protection. He says, listen, I've seen 600,000 of my fellow soldiers die since the day we spied out this land, Joshua. But God has kept me alive. The Lord has kept me alive, as he said, these 40 and 5 years, even since the Lord spake this word unto Moses, while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness, and now, lo, I am this day fourscore and five years old. As yet, I am as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me. Caleb stood on past promises, but he stayed strong in the present. He gave God credit. He primarily acknowledges God's protection. That's what he does first. But he also, I think this is interesting, he properly assessed his own strength. He knew 
something about himself. And I don't believe he was boasted. I do not believe that some old decrepit old man went, Hey, Joshua, I'm just as strong as the young whippersnappers here. I don't think he was some old toothless old geezer. I think he walked up with his shoulders back to Joshua and said, Joshua, I'm as strong... He was not being foolish or false in his assessment. He said, I am just as capable as I was 45 years ago. Listen, God didn't just allow him to be alive and survive. God helped him to continue to thrive even to old age. And he said, I can go to war. I can go out and come in. Can I just be honest? I think because he had been doing it. When the children of Israel took up arms to defend the, the, the Gibeonites... Listen, there's, there's no reason not to think that Caleb was not right there at the head of the pack of the tribe of Judah as they went to fight. And he went out and he came in. Listen, when Ai had beat them initially and killed 26 men and then they had to get all their troops together, there's no reason not to believe that Caleb did not have his sword. I believe that, listen, during the 40-year wander, wandering in the wilderness, I believe there were probably people from time to time saying, Hey, what do I hear over there in Judah's camp? Well, that's, Kay, that's Caleb sharpening his sword again. Really? Yeah, every day that he goes gathers wood, he goes chops up a mesquite bush with his sword. I, I mean, I'm just imagining. And there's maybe some young buck would say, Hey, old guy, what are you doing? And he would say, Listen, fellas... Everybody else my age is going to die out here, but not me. And I've still got some giants to kill in a few years, and I'm staying ready. I mean, I don't know that, but I think that that's probably the mentality. I don't think Caleb was passive for 40 years and then decided to be a soldier. No. I believe he knew he was able to go in and come out when it came to war because he was a warrior. He had stayed ready. Listen, I don't believe that his bow and arrow or sword or whatever weapon he used, it doesn't tell us and it's not that important. But the fact is, he made a proper assessment of his own strength. He had kept fighting. He had stayed ready for war. Do you know that Ephesians 6 verse 10 gives us a command that some of us don't realize is a command? The command is to believers in Christ, be strong. You may say, well, that seems counterintuitive. Did Paul say that it's in his weakness that Christ... Is? Yes. Listen, the strength we have is not our own. It's not a physical strength. It's not even a strength necessarily of personality or of ego. But it is a strength, a strong and firm reliance on God. And you as a child of God should be strong. Amen. It's New Testament believers that are commanded to be strong. Caleb said, I have obeyed that. I am just as strong as I used to be. Listen, Brother Hardy was at our camp out. I introduced him to Brother Mike. And, and I told him about Brother Mike witnessing to one of our neighbors. And you know what Brother Hardy told me? He said, I love baby Christians. He said, because when you're first saved, you just do what the, the little good Lord tells you to do. He said... You got to be saved quite a while before you figure out you know better than the Lord. And some of y'all probably heard him say something like that because he mentioned it. But can I tell you something? God forbid if our testimony is, well, I once was strong in the faith. But can I tell you something? I've seen Christians who have a spiritual peak. Man, there was that year or two where they were on fire. They were leading their family. They were teaching Sunday school. They were doing mission trips. They were serving the Lord. That's been a long time ago. Can I tell you something? I know that physically the ground has gotten a lot harder in the last 20 years. Amen? Listen, it, it bothers me a little bit. I am not as strong as I used to be. It bothers me sometimes to realize, you know what? My, physically speaking, my best days may be behind me. Physically speaking, amen? Now, I mean, Steve told me turners don't peak till 50, but I'm kind of wondering. <laughs> Dad, said, Dad said 70, not 50. But can I tell you something? 
I get hurt now, and it takes a long time to get better. Amen? But can I tell you something? The strength that we're talking about here is not something that should lessen as you get older. Do you know, I've seen, I've seen children of God that, listen, had been in the faith, strong in the faith, and as they got older, their faith did not waver. They were as strong the day they died as they were the day they got saved, if not stronger. So ask yourself a question. Are you as strong in the faith as you once were? Because Caleb, before he asked Joshua this request, he told him this truth. I'm as strong and ready today as I was 45 years ago. Are you staying ready for war? Do you know some of you, if you knew, listen, some of you, if you knew you were going to have to get up and teach or try to uh, lead someone to Christ, you'd be especially studied up that week. Can I tell you something? The command to be strong in the Lord, put on the whole armor of God, that's not an occasional when you feel like it, when you know something's coming. He says to put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand. The devil's not going to take an off week. And listen, you fail to put on your armor, it will be the day that you need it. Caleb was as strong and as ready for war because I believe he stayed ready. Caleb stayed strong in the present and then he looked at the future. Listen, Caleb saw the future by faith. He says, I'm as strong as I once was. Even so is my strength as it was then, so it is now. For war, he said, both to go out and come in. And I like that. Because you know what he was saying? He was saying, hey, I know there's some giants and I know there's some battles. But I ain't dying in battle. I'm going to go out and I'm going to come back in. You know why? Because God had promised him. You're going to have this. You're going to possess it. He says in verse 12, Now therefore give me this mountain whereof the Lord spake in that day. For thou heardest in that day how the Anakims were there. You know what I believe based on verse 12? I believe that Caleb, for years I saw the spies differently than I do now. I saw them splitting up like in groups of two or three or four. The cool thing is when there's 12, you can evenly split up in groups of two or three or four. And you can still... Uh, you know, have uh, accountability. And it would seem to make sense to me to spy out the promised land that the 12 sp spies split up as they traveled. And I used to think that it was Joshua and Caleb, the two faithfuls, and then the other 10 do-nothings, you know, that got scared. But that's not the case. It appears to me that Caleb and possibly some others saw Mount Hebron because he tells, do you remember when I told you? I don't really think Joshua had seen Mount Hebron the way Caleb had. And that is why Caleb was promised it, not Joshua, because Caleb was the one. He had seen the giants and he said, hey, you heard how they were. But I think Caleb could say with confidence, but I've seen them. Now give me this mountain. He says, if so be the Lord will be with me, then I shall be able to drive them out, as the Lord said. And by the way, this phrase may sound like there's doubt. That's not the way it's actually intended. He's saying, since the Lord has had favor in me and since the Lord has promised me this, I will be able to drive them out. And Joshua blessed him and gave unto Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, Hebron, for an inheritance. Hebron, therefore, became the inheritance of Caleb. Caleb saw the faith. Listen, he wanted what he had seen before. Do you know that the children of Israel refused to claim the promise given to Abraham? Abraham was told, Abraham, everywhere you look, everywhere your feet trod, I'm going to give that to you and your seed. Do you know that when the children of Israel refused to take the promised land, in essence, they were forfeiting a God-given promise that God had told them. But Caleb was not that way. Therefore, Joshua confirmed something that God had told all the way back to Abraham in Genesis. This place you walked and hiked and you saw, that's what I'm going to give you. You saw the mountain, you climbed it, you saw the giants, that's yours. He requested. And this is important. Do you know that he went to the authority figure? Joshua was not just Caleb's friend, he was his leader. And he asked for something that he knew God had already promised. But this is important. Do you know that it's never wrong to get good advice? Do you know it's never wrong to be under godly authority? Because godly authority will always only confirm God's word. Amen? 
He could ask his preacher about his plans because his plans were based on God's will. He wasn't worried about that. I mean, you may say, well, him asking Joshua, what if Joshua said, no, I think you're too old. Well, Joshua wasn't going to do that. Listen, Joshua and God were on the same team and Caleb had received a promise from God. They drove the giants out, the Bible says. This is important. When he asked God for all that he had been promised, he did not ask God to do things that he was capable of doing himself. This is important. I mean, if I saw giants that were possibly 10 foot tall, say the average Jewish guy was maybe 5 something, 5 foot something, I think I would have said, Joshua, give me this mountain and can you have a, could you have God do one of those amazing like um, hellstone missile fight come and just wipe those giants out for me? I mean, do you remember just a few weeks earlier, God had done that. He had sent some Patriot missile hell balls that killed the enemies of the Gibeonites. Do you know what the Bible says? The Bible says Caleb had to drive these giants out. And he did. The Bible says Caleb and the tribe of Judah, they slew these three famous giants. They drove them out. They killed them. Those three famous sons of Anak died at the hands of Caleb. I'm just saying, do you know that sometimes God will give you what you ask for, but He still expects you to fight? Amen? Do you know the Bible says if you lack wisdom, ask of God and He'll give it? Do you know the Bible also says in Proverbs that you might have to dig for it like it's hid treasure? Amen? Listen, sometimes God gives you something. I like that sequence that Jesus told there in the Sermon on the Mount. Ask and it shall be given. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door will be open. Do you know sometimes that can all be regarding one single request? You may say, what are you talking about? Sometimes you ask and God gives, but He says, I've given it to you, but you've got to look for it. I believe that. Do you know that if I want parenting advice and I ask you where I can get it, if you point to the Bible, you would be absolutely correct. The best inspired parenting handbook is sitting in our lap. You know the problem why some people don't know what God says about parenting, though? Is they're not willing to seek. Amen? And can I be real honest? There's times when you seek and you find, but there's times when you're not able to open the door and you've got to knock and ask God. That shows some patience. Listen, Caleb, he asked for a big ask. He asked for a big request. He said, I want the mountain, and that's what God gave him. He saw the future. He renewed the mission that he had started on 40 years before. I mentioned this, but the very same giants that scared him 40 years earlier were there. Do you know that some of us are real good at avoiding difficult areas in our lives? But the truth is there are certain things that if we don't address them, they don't go away. Amen? Amen? You know, sometimes we have to take out a giant before we can possess the mountain. And if you decide, I'm not ready to fight that giant, well, that's fine, but then he keeps the mountain. The giants were in the same place they left them, and it was the same giants. Amen? You may say, well, Clay, uh, you're kind of beating around the bush. Well, let me just be real plain. Do you know that if you have unforgiveness and bitterness... That can be a giant that you're not willing to face. Amen? But in my experience, do you know that unless you, by the power of God, and listen, sometimes it's as simple as, based, based on the word of God, it's as simple as a moment of surrender to God. Isn't that ironic that the way to victory is surrender to God sometimes? But can I tell you something? It, many times, that's a giant that people are unwilling to face. Listen, men, some of you, listen, uh, you may have a giant of addiction and you refuse to face it. And the fact is, it's been 40 years and it hasn't gone anywhere. It's still got you by the nose. Listen, some of us, we avoid difficulty. And therefore, since we're not willing to engage in the fight, we are not able to enjoy the fruit. 
Listen, Caleb wasted no time. Once Joshua gave it to him, it would appear that he immediately went and took possession. It was 45 years in the waiting and he was ready. And he drove out the giants that had seemed so formidable earlier. Do you know that God will give you grace to do what he calls you to do? Do you know God will give you the ability to possess the portion that he gives you? Do you know you're not, you're not called to be... Uh, something that you're not but you are by God's grace equipped to be everything he has called you to be listen young people if you'll simply ask God what have you allotted to me what what are you wanting for me and my life and then don't listen don't give up and give in just because it's a waiting process Listen, Caleb never settled for anything less than God's best. He just had to wait 45 years for it. Can I tell you something? I, in my experience, waiting is becoming, listen, it is becoming almost a thing of the past. It is a virtue. I've heard it said patience is a virtue. Well, it's one that is almost entirely gone by the wayside in our culture. We don't wait for anything. Listen, it blows my mind people get mad at a 15 minute wait for fast food. And listen, the guy at Sonic, he's very apologetic. And he's bringing out my bacon burger or whatever, and it took him longer, you know. But in my mind, I'm thinking, how long would it take me to make a bacon burger? <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, it blows my mind that there's people that are actually almost fighting mad if they're forced to wait five minutes longer on something that, by the way, a hundred years ago would have taken you a week of preparation to get in your hands. Amen? But we're in an instant society. Listen, even in information, listen, and I'm guilty. I've gotten used to being able, you know, on Lauren's phone if I need information and I, I Google it. I mean, if the wheel turns for more than three seconds, I'm hitting more buttons. <laughs> right? Did you double click it? Oh, did I double click it? I double clicked it 20 times. Click, 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 click. Right? I mean, we're not patient. Listen, this grieves me. But I know young people who aren't even willing. Listen, they're not willing to wait 45 days, much less Caleb waiting 45 years. Do you know Joseph was faithful for like 17 years? from the time he was promised to be in ruler leadership and the time he got there. Listen, I know young people, listen, they get in their mid-twenties, they can't keep waiting for the right one. Why, they're in their mid-twenties. You want them to be an old maid? Okay, sure, so then settle for something, settle for a big dose of misery. And listen, Caleb, listen, he waited, and when he got what he wanted, he still had a fight. I hate to point this out, but do you know that many times we continue to have this mindset that the grass will be greener on the other side of the fence, but the same God that preserved Caleb for 45 years of waiting was the same God he was going to have to rely on to knock these giants down. And I'm just saying that sometimes we believe that we will be satisfied if we just get into the next place when the truth is the next place is another battle. And listen, and once he conquered Hebron, then the next hill over. Kirjath Sefer needed to be conquered and then he had to plan a wedding. He gave his daughter away to uh, kinfolk who wiped out the next town. And listen, if you, if you could go, I really believe if you could go and interview Caleb, there was nothing better than possessing what God gave him. But he was not living in the lap of luxury. He was living in land that he had to fight for. He had to fight for it. Listen, the victorious Christian life, this side of glory, will always contain a fight. He secured his possession by faith. They drove out and they took care of the giants. But it was something he had to wait for. And I just want to encourage you. I believe Caleb had a strength of character that came from watching God's faithfulness even during four, 40 years of judgment. You know, I would like to think that God 
could grant mercy and maybe a revival in America. I would like to think that. But you know what this story confirms in my mind? That even if you're one in a million, if you'll be faithful, God can take care of you. Amen? God has blessed America. I don't know for how long. Listen, there, there may be a time when, listen, everybody else goes by the wayside. You know what my prayer is? My prayer is we will occupy until Jesus comes. We'll be faithful. That we'll have the courage of Caleb. But if we do that, then listen, we cannot stand on public opinion. We have to stand on God's promises. Amen? We have to take the word of God and live our lives accordingly. We must stay strong. It is not a bad thing to stand strong. Do you know the attacks that are coming against us today? Listen, if you're going to stand strong on the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. Are you going to be informed by the world's false agenda or by the timeless truth of the Word of God? It's important. Listen, do you know what your children and even yourselves are going to be indoctrinated in? Heavy doses in the coming days. Things like critical race theory. You may say, well, maybe that's, maybe that's good and that's just trying. No, do you know what it is? It's based on a godless philosophy. Do you know the Bible says there's one race, Adam's race? I mean, I mean we're... We're, we're a special creation created in the image of God. Even the term of different races, you go back to where that started getting divided up, it goes back to old Darwin who believed that we were nowhere kin to people who had darker, darker pigment than us. They were closer to apes than we were. Our colleges are more than happy to teach that garbage rather than the truth of the Word of God. And then they wonder why people act like animals when you spend two generations telling people that's what they are. They are undermining absolutes. This is going on now. These are the battles that we will face. They're undermining absolutes to where, listen, in our culture, we're moving into a time when the only accepted bigotry and the only accepted venom and evil and hatred that you can pour out are on people who you label as mean. And if you believe the Bible, well, that's just mean. It's coming, and you'll become a target. And listen, I can see it, and it bothers me. It already, I, can already get, I can already get shades of it when I listen to my bus kids discuss current topics as being framed by even... You may say, well, Clay, we live in the Bible Belt, but I'm telling you, when you take a group of kids... By the way, we're all fallen. Do you know your kids, my kids, all kids? The Bible says foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. And then you give those children who have fallen sin natures, you give unlimited access to them, and they are being accessed by the evils that come through these. Listen, and I, I'm sorry that you can say, well, aren't you borrowing your dad's soapbox here? But if you give your kids unlimited ac internet access, you are giving the enemy access to your children. Amen. And, and listen, we're moving into a day when there's going to be very few willing to stand and fight. And I pray that you are. But if you are, it's going to be because you are more in love with the sword of the word of God than you are with the wisdom of this world. He secured his possession because he stayed strong. Listen, I pray that the day the Lord returns, I'm as strong in the faith as the day he saved me if not stronger, amen? It's okay to get stronger. We're to grow. God forbid if we retire from serving God. Caleb was 85, but he wasn't retired. He was just fixing to move into his most important ministry. If you're here tonight and you're saved, could I just ask you, are you, are you living in victory and courage? Or are you just kind of wandering around? If you're saved, listen, do you have a vision? What are you asking God for? 
What have you requested? Listen, is there a promise that God's given you? I'll just be real honest, something that I'm praying. I want my kids to have a call on their life. I want my kids to be used by God. I want my kids to know that there's some non-negotiables, and among those are serving God, being a blessing to people, loving our neighbor and loving God. I want them to have heart for the lost and a willingness to serve. But I don't believe they'll get those things accidentally. I believe I'll have to be intentional. I believe there's battles I'll have to fight. I want to see souls saved. Can I tell you something? I don't believe people are generally soul winners by accident. As you pursue God and seek to secure what He has given you. Listen, I think we ought to ask God, God, there's a certain mountain. I'd like you to give that to me. I've been running scared and there's this giant of addiction and there's this area. Maybe not even everybody knows about it, but God, you know it and I know it and I want victory there. Give me that mountain. Some of us need to pray that today. And then I want to encourage you, if you're here and you're lost, you know Jesus will save you. If you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior, Jesus loves you. He died for you and He rose again and you need to be saved. I'm going to ask Bree to come to the piano. We're going to close. Do you have the kind of courage that Caleb demonstrated? Listen, do you know if you got God on your side, you're a majority. You're a majority. You, you don't have to be voted most popular as long as you're pleasing the Lord. You don't have to get the accolades and the acclaim as long as you're accepted by Christ. I, I just want to challenge you that if God has revealed to you that there's an area where you're not walking in victory, would you ask God to give you this kind of courage? Stand on His promises. I'm not saying to be presumptuous. Listen, Caleb's brethren that turned on God in doubt, then they turned away from Moses and Caleb and Joshua in presumption and tried to go up and they lost. I'm not talking about being presumptuous. But can I tell you something? Some things God made clear. If God has given you a vision, then are you willing to fight for it? As Miss Bree plays, I'd like you to stand with me with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. Are you going to be strong? Are you going to be serving the Lord? Are you going to fall by the wayside? Listen, there's promises in God's Word. Do you know them? Can you stand on them? And there's a fight coming. Are you strong? If not, the source of strength is here. In Ephesians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul says that He would grant you according to the riches of His glory to be strengthened with might by His Spirit in the inner man. You say, Clay, I feel weak. Well, here's the source of strength. His Spirit and His Word. If you're here and you're not saved, then you need to trust Christ tonight. The pastor is right here and He'll meet you. She's going to play one more verse. And if you don't come, you'll close the invitation. If you need to be saved, would you come? She's going to play through one more verse. If you need to come, come right away. Jesus loves you, died on the cross for you. He wants to save you. I need thee every hour. (laughs) 
every hour. Amen. Praise the Lord. God bless you, Clay, once again. Thank you for that uh, powerful message. What a challenge. Uh, we might as well fight the job.